So, Eugene, you wrote today about how Harris's task in these final days is tricky. Uh, how do you balance a negative message aimed at Trump, the most negative we've heard, arguably, but one that is simultaneously positive about Harris herself and what she can do for the country? So how does she pull that off? Yeah, to you and Maya's point, you know, trying, she she's doing something that no one has had to do before. By this point, all of the bio work, right, all the biography work that a campaign needs to do for their candidate and their nominee has kind of already been done, right? <laughs> if we were, if this was Joe Biden, you wouldn't be, you, he wouldn't have to talk about, you know, his faith from a stage to kind of give people an idea of how he works in that way. Donald Trump doesn't need to do that. Harris does have to do that. And so it is going to be difficult, right? I think the biggest thing that this campaign has tried to do is the contrast, but using it as split images, right? When there was the hurricane, having Harris go out and meet with FEMA while Donald Trump was talking about some of the conspiracy theories that he has about FEMA and how it works, right? Those kinds of things. And what we're going to see and, ha and got a preview yesterday is that closing message, right? Harris has kind of, at the beginning of her campaign, and even at the DNC, talked about Donald Trump as kind of an unserious man who, if he's elected, has uh, will have serious consequences. Now, because her campaign says they feel like it's getting, his, his language is getting darker and worse, she is becoming, she is escalating that language. So calling him a fascist, whether or not she does that again on, on Tuesday is yet to be seen, but she is going to have to continue to tell people what she wants who she is, what she's going to do as president, and also talk to them about what she believes and the danger her and her campaign and Democrats and some Republicans believe Donald Trump is to the country. And doing that quickly um, is is difficult. I will say, at this point, their biggest audience, especially including last night, is going to be those moderate, middle-of-the-road voters, white women um, that are non-college educated, because they feel like they can move those women more, not just on abortion, but on some of these other issues. But I wonder, Maya, if she's in the same place she was at the beginning of the campaign and, frankly, the same place Joe Biden was in when he was running, which is this. Uh, how tough is it to convince Americans to base their vote on an argument, this is what's going to happen if Donald Trump gets elected and it's bad, versus their life experience, what they're living, the economy, immigration, the things that worry them, um, and they're feeling, frankly, in a lot of the polls, they think, especially with the economy, it was better and will be better under Trump. Right. I think, you know, I think that, that drawing the contrast in is an incredibly important one. But I think what she's able to do and I think what she needs to continue to do is to make it clear that it's not just this is how bad it will be under Trump. It's this is the plan we have for you, for your family. And I think she has been able to make that point really clear. But I think when we're dealing with someone who represents the kind of threat that Donald Trump represents, it is impossible to do any kind of a split screen, to say anything like, this is what I would do, without immediately also bringing in the comparison that not just does he not have a plan for you and your family, this is the threat he represents for people. I think it is impossible to almost separate those two arguments. They go hand in hand. She is making an affirmative case for herself. But part of that affirmative case is based on the fact that right now we have one ticket that is talking about a future and one ticket that is talking about not just a past, but a genuine threat to the democracy that we have. And a lot of what we've heard from her over the last several days, Eugene, is responding to Donald Trump and what they see as his dangerous language, right? But then let's look at the other side. Um, according to NBC, uh, Trump's campaign wants him to lean into issues, especially the economy, because, <laughs> quote, a shift to the personal narrative could distract from the substantive issues that Trump aides believe are giving their candidate a leg up over his Democratic rival. Uh, but, I mean... I don't know, is that directive from his campaign, which is based on polling, which I'm sure is based on their own internal research, a closing message he's already rejected? How much do you think he cares about what the people in his campaign are saying this is what's going to work? 
Yeah, he rejected that in 2015, right? Like, this is, this, this, the way that he's been running for president this entire time, this is his third time, you know, his campaign, the folks on it, they know what he is going to say and do. He feels in, that his gut, he trusts his gut more than anyone, right? He will tell you that he has said that. He has talked about it even while he was president, listening to people in the room and then making his own decision, no matter what um, any of them say. And he was going to do that anyway, right? It's sometimes hard to know if he was. Was, but that is how he has always operated. Is 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 by it. He is he, he is not always moved by policy prescriptions unless it's kind of the top ones that he sees move his voters. Right, immigration. He's talked about the economy a lot. One of the issues that the Trump campaign is facing that if you look at polling now and, and where um, Biden was before he dropped out, the, they have done a, an interesting job of, of kind of defanging the economy and immigration as, as bad issues for Harris, right? She has done a better job at threading the needle and talking about, you know, the threat that Donald Trump faces in her eyes, but also, more importantly, that prices are too, um, prices are too high, right? That was not something that you were hearing from the Biden campaign. Um, and they are moving forward with that. Now, Trump himself, he is probably going to get he is going to get a playbook. They're going to tell him what he they think works best. They're going to show him the polling. But when he gets on the stage, that changes, right? That has always been the case. And you know, folks like Chris Lasavita and Susie Wiles, who are at the top of the campaign, they are have done a better job than any of the other campaign managers of trying to push him to talk more about policy. But even when he's doing it, it only lasts for a certain amount of time. You can think about town halls when people ask him questions about policy, and then he veers off into talking about something that has nothing to do with it. And so that is a struggle they're going to have to deal with as this campaign mm. moves forward. But also, voters have already seen this from Donald Trump for a long time. Yeah. So, Aaron, let's go back to where you are, Georgia. Uh, there's going to be a, a couple of gentlemen there, Barack Obama, Bruce Springsteen, mm -hmm. along with Kamala Harris, who's uh, scheduled to leave uh, for Atlanta sometime this hour. We just got word as well about Beyonce tomorrow. So tell us about the plan in the end of the next to last full week of this campaign. Yeah, 12 days left in this campaign cycle, and the uh, gates behind me at the stadium behind me are going to open here in a couple of hours. This is an opportunity the vice president's campaign believes for her to join with these other popular figures uh, and to really push people to actually go vote. The campaign is that they've been able to generate some enthusiasm around the vice president's candidacy, but now is the time to take that enthusiasm and translate it into uh, votes cast at these polling sites uh, around the country, or uh, in many cases, cast by mail. And the uh, the activity that we'll see tonight with former President Obama, with Bruce Springsteen, with Tyler Perry, with uh, Samuel L. Jackson and Spike Lee, uh, this is really an effort to say to people, uh, we these, these those folks will say to people, we want you to pay attention to what Vice President Harris has to say. And then the vice president has to actually step up and close the deal to make uh, her, her, her case known to people who maybe haven't been paying close attention up to this point uh, and to try to encourage them to actually go out and vote. Also to that end, and we know the vice president now will appear in Houston, Texas tomorrow uh, with Beyonce. This was all, an event that was already on her schedule that was designed for her to talk about reproductive rights. Uh, we learned from sources today that Beyonce will appear with her on stage and that Beyonce will perform as well. Uh, this obviously is a woman who uh, has a, a music following, but she's a businesswoman as well. There are people who are uh, the most voracious Beyonce fans who uh, cut across age and gender and race. And so here again, an opportunity for people who pay close attention to everything that Beyonce does to now see Vice President Harris and potentially hear her message as she works toward uh, her closing argument in this election cycle. Chris, it's also worth noting that we've learned from sources the vice president will make that closing argument speech, if you will, uh, as you noted earlier, on the ellipse, on the National Mall, right in front of the White House, White House, right at the same location where Donald Trump was speaking on January 6, 2021, before the uh, attack on the U.S. Capitol, the vice president taking that opportunity to try to draw a contrast between uh, Donald Trump's worst day in office, the campaign, a campaign official argues, and the positive uh, uh, vision that the vice president has for what would happen in a Harris administration. So again, Chris? that balancing act. All right, Maya. So let's talk strategy. 
uh, and somebody who's been on the inside of that with campaigns. So Harris's event today is in a county Biden won by almost 70 points in 2020. Trump, on the other hand, is going to Maricopa County, Arizona. He lost that the last time around. What, if anything, does that tell you uh, about, you know, Harris campaigning in a deep blue place while Trump is heading to a place he's trying to flip? I think that right now where, what she's trying to do, and I think what we'll see is she is trying to make sure that we are capitalizing on the excitement that we have seen for her campaign to make sure that that translates into actually driving up turnout, making sure that people get out. I think the decision to campaign in a deep blue place at a, on a day like this where she has a big announcement, she obviously has people are going to be incredibly um, excited hearing that she's going to appear with uh, Beyonce, that you know she's continuing to get these big name endorsements. The goal there is to make sure that people who are early voting right now are turning those ballots in, are getting excited. They're calling their friends. They're finishing their postcards and sending them in. They're doing everything that they can in these final days, because basically what she has with that enthusiasm is a bunch of organizers who can go out and do a lot of this work. And she is trying to make sure that that enthusiasm translates into votes. I think what Donald Trump is showing is that, yes, he is, I mean, he is still, he's he's going somewhere he wants to try to flip, but that it is a much, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have the ability to sort of capitalize on the enthusiasm and momentum. He's trying to build that up. So I think that's, it's just a difference in sort of orientation of the campaign. They're both playing into where they, they think that they can be the strongest.